Well, welcome to session six of the uh, conservative intellectual tradition in America. Uh, I'm Mallory Factor. I'm going to be your guide through this course. Today, we have a very exciting lecture on the emergence of libertarianism. Libertarianism and classical liberalism uh, and we're, is really a subject that we have not even begun to deal with yet. And today is going to be the beginning of looking at the different forms of conservatism. Our speaker, however, has a very strong bent in this area. He's a political activist, and he's also the current president and executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, which is a nonprofit organization in Irving, California, whose mission it is to promote Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. For seven years, he was an award-winning finance professor at Santa Clara University. And in 1998, he co-founded a financial advisory firm, BH Equity Research, of which he's presently managing director and chairman. Born in Israel and a member of the Israel Intelligence Service, former member, that is, he's co-author of Neoconservatism, an obituary, for an, an obituary for an idea, and he's also a contributor to winning the unwinnable war, America's self-crippled response to Islamic totalitarianism. It gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce my friend, Dr. Yaron Brook. <clears throat> Thank you, Mallory. Um, this is a real pleasure, uh, particularly given the, uh, the lineup that you guys, I can't, I can't believe how lucky you 12 are in terms of the lineup of speakers that you have in this class. So it, it is a real honor for me to be part of that lineup. Um, and I think this topic is a really exciting topic right now. Uh, this question about the significance of libertarian ideas, even Ayn Rand's ideas, in the conservative movement right now, I think, is an important issue and a very, very relevant issue. And I'll just give you a, a few concretes to, to kind of make this real. Um, Obviously, the most striking example of, of libertarianism right now is, of course, the candidacy of Ron Paul. And uh, Ron Paul is running as a libertarian conservative. Uh, and I think has really shaken things up a little bit and, and for, forced other candidates to deal with certain economic issues, certain issues about what is the role of government that conservatives are not always comfortable dealing with and don't always want to deal with, certainly not kind of deal with this more extreme position that, that Ron Paul has taken up, this more radical position. Um, Ayn Rand has, has, has played a significant role, I think, in the last uh, year or so, no, actually last three years, uh, within the conservative movement. And really, she's played a role, not so much among the candidates or among the leadership of the conservative movement, but in the Tea Parties. And if you've been to Tea Party demonstrations, um, then you've seen signs which say things like, Atlas is shrugging. Well, where does that come from? It comes from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged. Or signs that say, who is John Galt? Or if they were a little pretentious, they say, I am John Galt. A little pretentious, I think, but, but where does that come from? That's the opening line and a, and a really theme throughout the novel, Ayn Rand's novel, Atlas Shrugged. And I think, again, Ayn Rand is challenging conservatism, is asking questions about conservatism that are crucial, particularly at this point in American history where we're faced with ever-growing government, ever-growing liabilities we can't pay for, and a real crisis in confidence in, in our system of government, in the way our government functions. And here are these challenges, both from a, a Ron Paul type, he calls himself a conservative libertarian, and an Ayn Rand who is different. We'll talk about in what ways different, but quite radical, particularly in, for conservatives to, I think, I think grapple with. Um, so I think it's really important to, to if you, when studying conservatism and studying conservatism in America, uh, both in terms of understanding the history uh, of, of kind of the impact of libertarian and, and Randian ideas on the conservative movement, but also, and maybe more importantly, in projecting out into the future. Uh, because it does look like these kind of ideas are bubbling up to the surface and maybe are going to have more of an impact on American politics as we move into the future than they have had in the past. So what I'd like to do is um, I'd like to start by 
you know, giving you a little bit of background on kind of the history of, of, of the libertarian, the modern libertarian movement, where it came from, the impact I think it's already had on the conservative movement. Um, you know, it's different factions. You will find that libertarianism, just like conservatism, just like a lot of the isms, have a variety of different factions, different approaches. Uh, Ron Paul comes from a particular school within, I'd say, the libertarian movement. There are other schools. There are other perspectives on, on, uh, on some of the issues he addresses. So I'd like to cover that, and then I'd like to talk about Ayn Rand subjectivism. Um, you know, what, what's unique about it, what's different about it than, than uh, uh, libertarianism. And then talk about the future, talk about how I think this plays out uh, as we move into the future. To understand, I think both the growth, the, the growth of modern conservatism and the growth of modern libertarianism, I think you really have to go back to post-World War II America. Uh, and understand kind of where we were at that point. 1944, 1945, the war is ending. We just defeated uh, Hitler and the Japanese, two, you know, fascist empires with ideas of world domination, but two ideologically heavily collectivistic regimes, right? Regimes that emphasize collectivism. At the same time, the largest collectivistic uh, ideology, a most dominant one of 1940s, is what? It's communism, as embedded in, in the Soviet Union and just a few years later in Mao's China. So communism is dominant. It's on the rise. Indeed, we hand over, uh, for another lecture, we hand over the whole of Eastern Europe to communism at the end of World War II. Uh, and the world, as you follow in the late 40s and early 50s, slowly, country after country, is falling under the spell of communism. This is an ideology that really has enthralled people. Uh, at the same time, in the United States itself, we are emerging from the Great Depression, an era where the collectivism, these ideas of state control, these ideas of sacrificing individual liberty for the sake of the state for the sake of the economy, for the sake of the group. Uh, we have just gone through over a decade, 15 years, of significant increase in the size of government, the role of government, and this notion that it's okay to sacrifice the individual for the group, that it's okay to sacrifice some individuals for the economy or for reducing unemployment. And there's a debate in the 40s. Has it worked or hasn't it worked? Right? To this day, I think we're having a debate, although I think our side won. It didn't work. but. You know, the debates, Krugman, uh, Nobel Prize in economics, I don't have a Nobel Prize, uh, would disagree with me, obviously. But this is a debate going on in the 40s. Uh, the fear is, among those who uh, admire individual liberty, who admire the Founding Fathers, who admire kind of pre-Great Depression, 19th century America, the fear is that collectivism is rising in America. It's not a fear, it's a reality and that collectivism is dominating the rest of the world in the form of the worst form of collectivism imagine, imaginable to man, which is communism. So that's the context. This, all this is going on. And in 1944, uh, I, and, and there were a number of thinkers during the 30s and 40s that are talking about this and that are arguing against collectivism, arguing against communism. I mean, Ayn Rand is in the mix here. She writes a novel in the 1930s called We the Living, which is uh, close to autobiographical. She, she came from the Soviet Union. She, she experienced communism. And she writes a book about communism. And just to give you a sense, the book was a complete you know, failure in terms of its sales because the intelligentsia in America in the 1930s were enamored by communism. They couldn't believe it was this bad. It only was in the 50s and the 60s when they realized what Stalin had done did the American left and the American intelligentsia realize that communism was really, really a bad thing. But in the 30s and 40s, they were enamored by this. So there were a lot of voices, but a, a, a small book published in the UK in England in 1944 really seemed to resonate a lot with both conservatives and, and many who, uh, who were worried about the rise of collectivism. And that is The Road to Serfdom by F.A. Hayek. Uh, Hayek is probably, um, Probably, if you look today, probably the most influential libertarian thinker uh, of modern times. Certainly the most influential libertarian thinker on conservatism. They might have been more important libertarian thinkers qua libertarianism. But in terms of the impact on conservatives, Hayek is probably 
had the most impact, and conservatives like him, and you'll see why they like him in a minute. Um, Hayek was, a, uh, was an Austrian, uh, an economist, a brilliant economist, one of, the, one of the really great economists of the 20th century, a free market economist, uh, uh, clearly an advocate for minimal government intervention. Uh, and he writes The Order of Sodom. The Order of Sodom is this book that describes, uh, basically, a thesis is this. If you allow governments to grow, if you plant the seed of collectivism, what you get in the end is authoritarianism. He says Nazism doesn't come out of nowhere. Nazism is the consequence of the seed of collectivism that it took years and years and years to cultivate in Germany, and in the end you get fascism. Communism didn't come out of nowhere. It's the seed of collectivism that slowly government grows, slowly implant itself, it changes people's attitudes about life, and you get communism. And he said what's happening in the West in the 1940s, remember, uh, I don't know if you, you won't remember, but maybe, maybe you've studied history enough to, to, to know that, you know, Churchill won World War II for the UK. I mean, Churchill is a giant. But in the elections of 1946, or 1945, I think, Churchill is voted out of office. He just won the war. You'd think this guy would storm, you know, the elections would be easy. He loses, and he loses to the socialists. He loses to the British Labor Party, because the West is moving left so fast that even Churchill can't win an election. So Hayek is warning the British that this is what's going to happen. Uh, the book comes to America. It becomes a huge success here. It, uh, you know, it, it sells many, many copies. Uh, spurs a lot of thinkers to come out of the woodwork in support of these ideas. Now, Hayek, uh, at the same time as he clearly believes in free market and is a strong free market advocate in certain areas, certainly from an economics perspective, he's, a, again, a brilliant economist. But he's also a compromiser a little bit because Hayek also says, look, the state does have a role here and there in facilitating competition and helping the markets along. You know, so he's not a purist when it comes to markets. He allows for significantly more government than many libertarians did at the time and will, you know, post Hayek. And this is why conservatives like him, because he's not a purist, and conservatives are not purists when it comes to free markets, right? I mean, conservatives do not believe in limited government, limiting it to, you know, setting up property rights and leaving the markets alone, right? Which is what, as we'll talk about, what libertarians hold. Conservatives want to tinker. Right? And you can see it in this presidential campaign. I mean, uh, who are the conservatives? St. Thomas the conservative, he wants to tinker. He wants to give special privileges to manufacturers because manufacturing is better than service. Why? Because St. Thomas decided, right? And we can have an argument whether that's true or not. But the point is he, qua politician, wants to dictate to the marketplace that manufacturing is better than this. Or, or you know, Gingrich wants to give these tax favors and those tax Each one of them wants to manipulate the market in a different way based on their agenda. And that's typical of conservatives. Conservatives are not hands off, you know, completely hands off, right? So Hayek kind of bridges. He's, he's got a foot here and a foot there. He never considered himself a conservative. Uh, he actually wrote a whole essay on why I'm not a conservative, where he criticizes conservatives. I mean, one of the biggest criticisms he have is, is, is the word, right? Where does the word conservative comes from? It comes from the word conserve. Well, what exactly are we trying to conserve, right? Things suck, right, to put it, I don't know if I can say suck on video, but, you know, <laughs> things are bad. What do we want to conserve about the things that exist today, right? What do we want to conserve about the things that existed the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years? So he, he considered himself, uh, as all libertarians consider themselves, I mean, it's a kind of an interesting twist. Libertarians consider themselves liberals, but not modern liberals, liberals of the past, 19th century-like liberals. They consider themselves progressives because they're for progress. Not leftist progressives, not progressives that need government in order to move things forward, but they want to leave the markets alone to progress. But they are revolutionaries, they're radicals, they're not conservatives in the sense of wanting to conserve. At least that's you know, Hayek's, Hayek's view. And, and if, if you read, there's a, there's a new website that the Cato Institute, which is a libertarian uh, think tank, has just uh, started a few months ago called libertarianism.org. If you go there, 
and you trace the way they write, the way the libertarians write about their history, they trace their roots to every kind of free thinker, liberal thinker, liberal meant free thinker. Uh, uh, you know, they, the liberals in America stole the word. They reversed its meaning. The pro-capitalists, 100 years ago, were all liberals. And, the, the, you know, modern liberals flipped the term. They, Ayn Rand calls it a stolen concept. They stole the concept from the right and turned it into a leftist concept. So they traced themselves back to the Greeks and the Romans and Cicero and to the founding fathers and so on. And, uh, so, so Hayek is a, is, a, is a crucial figure. He ultimately comes and teaches at the University of Chicago. We'll talk about the University of Chicago in a minute because there's another branch kind of libertarianism that comes out of there. Um, another important figure that I just want to mention here because I think he represents, from my perspective at least, kind of the pure form of libertarianism and the, and the more rational form of libertarianism is, is, a, is a, probably the greatest economist of the 20th century. Um, and that is a guy named Ludwig von Mises, uh, M-I-S-E-S. And von Mises, also Austrian, and indeed the school of thought that combines von Mises and Hayek is called the Austrian School of Economics. And in my view, the best school of economics out there. So that they get it. Um, von Mises was actually Hayek's teacher. Uh, Hayek, when he came to study with von Mises, was actually a socialist. And von Mises turned him into a capitalist. He flipped him. Uh, so uh, von Mises is responsible for... for, for you know, giving us the economist that is Hayek. Uh, von Mises was, a, was a, a, again, the great economist and a, and a purist here. I mean, von Mises believed that government has only one role, and that is in the economic sphere, that is the protection of property rights. You set up the rules for property rights, and then you go catch the crooks, right? Catch the fraudsters, catch the criminals. But other than that, no regulations, no incentives, no manipulation of the market, no all of these regulatory agencies that we have today, no government involvement in the economy. None. I mean, it's hard to imagine. <laughs> but no FDA, no SEC, no uh, you know, uh, Department of Commerce. I don't know what they do. I guess they, they take CEOs around the world and show them off. Um, no Department of Labor, no special rules for unions. Unions can form, but they get no government privileges. Uh, nothing, no government involvement in the economy. Leave it alone. Okay. Uh, and Mises, uh, Mises, I think, you know, has a huge influence on kind of the libertarian movement, again, particularly among economists. And notice that the main libertarians, the, 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 the most important libertarians are all economists. Uh, libertarianism really comes out of and this is kind of the, the utilitarian grounding, they come out of an economic understanding of the world, from an economic understanding of how markets work. And they say, markets work, what do we need government for? We'll see that Ayn Rand approaches this differently. But their view is, you know, this is what happens in economics, right? If you leave people alone, all these good things happen. And if you look at history, when we leave markets alone, boom, standard of living goes up, boom, GDP goes up. Quality of life goes up. Uh, you know, we get industrialization, we get technology, we get iPhones, we get iPads, we get good stuff, right? When you regulate, when you control, you get crises, you get poverty, you get decline, you get recessions, you get distortions in the marketplace. So, purely economic analysis. If we don't have an FDA, you know, private entities will come up to rank, rate drugs or, or to test our food or to do that. We don't need the FDA because the economics, will, the incentives of capitalism will drive private people to do that. And we, you know, they'll be more trustworthy than the bureaucrat who does it. And for every one of these questions you might have, they have a really neat, and I think true, economic solution to how this would work under free markets, how this would work under capitalism. Okay. So this is kind of the, 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 the von Mises school. Uh, uh, he's a purist when it comes to this. No government intervention. And probably... You know, within the libertarian movement, I would argue probably von Mises is the most uh, influential of the, of the uh, libertarian thinkers, the economists. He actually taught uh, at NYU. And it's interesting that both Hayek, and, uh, when he taught at uh, Chicago, Hayek ultimately taught uh, in London. And uh, just as an aside, was very influential on in Margaret Thatcher. So he, he sat at a place called uh, the uh, Institute for Economic Affairs. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, who completely changed, uh, you know, the British economy and, and, and the UK, completely revolutionized it towards more freedom. 
I mean, she'll go down as one of the great political, in my view, and I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody, she is bi bigger than Ronald Reagan. I mean, she had, and there's no question about this, she had a more profound impact on the UK than Ronald Reagan had on the US. Uh, because the UK was in what, much worse shape than we were in, 19, uh, in the late 1970s. So she's a, um, she literally studied with Hayek. She, you know, she was there at AEI and, and they were Chad. He was probably in his 70s, 80s by that point. Um, but uh, so he had a profound impact on the politics of, of the UK, at least under Thatcher. Uh, both Hayek and von Mises, when they got university positions in the US, they were funded with external grants. They couldn't get like tenure, regular tenured positions from the university because the universities, even then, were so dominated by collectivist, anti free market, anti capitalist forces that they had to get their own funding from foundations and from uh, institutions to be able to get their positions. Um, uh, one th a, third, uh, a third economist that I want to uh, quickly deal with, uh, because he's so well known and, and probably the most well known libertarian, is Milton Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman from the University of Chicago, uh, you know, started a school, really started before him uh, by a guy named Frank Knight, but started a school called the, the University of Chicago School of Economics. Um, is considered a, a libertarian, considered himself a libertarian, I think was considered a libertarian at the, uh, while he was alive, uh, was a big free market economist, uh, made a lot of arguments uh, for free markets. What's interesting about Milton Friedman, uh, particularly as compared to von Mises, is Mises and the Austrians, this Austrian school of economics, very much worked outside of mainstream economics. They were the fringe guys. They never published in the big journals. They, they didn't, you know, they, they weren't considered mainstream. Milton Friedman used the tools of conventional mainstream economics to, sh to kind of advocate for free markets. And, and as a consequence, I think, became more well-known than they did, certainly within the field of economics. Even his opponents, you know, have a high regard for him. Um, he is a big advocate, again, of free markets. Markets work. Um, markets, uh, leaving individual alone is right. Um, and, it, and it just, and it works, you know, and, and again, this goes back to Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith writing in The Wealth of Nations, 1776, shows that when you leave individuals alone, the economy succeeds, the economy grows. Um, Friedman uh, is very successful at Chicago. Uh, you have today in, at universities all over America, uh, many of his students, uh, in terms of influence on the field of economics, much bigger than, than, uh, than the others. Uh, although Friedman, like I think a little bit like Hayek, compromises. So uh, f there's a big debate among libertarians about s do we need a central bank or don't we need a central bank. Uh, you'll see again that I think Ayn Rand approaches a question like that very differently. But uh, Milton Friedman comes down at least most of his life on the side of yes, we do, although towards the end of his life, supposedly he changed his mind and said we don't need a central bank. Hayek, again, depends on what you read. Sometimes he's for central bank, sometimes he's against. Mises was never for central bank, always for free banking, uh, no central bank, and, and uh, many of the today's Austrian economists uh, support that position of no need for a central bank um, today. So I think these are the three big economists who, who really shaped and had an influence on the world out there, certainly in terms of their economic uh, teaching. And so so what, what, is, what unites them? Um, what unites them is a, is a respect for the marketplace, a respect for capitalism, a respect for how markets work, and the idea that if markets are left alone, they not only solve the problems, but they create wealth. They, you know, they create enormous amounts of wealth. They allow the poor to rise up from poverty. You know, they allow techno technological innovation. They allow creativity. They allow for everything that we want materially at least, they make possible. And much of what we want spiritually is made possible by the fact that we have wealth. You know? So if you really enjoy listening to music, which is a spiritual activity, right? Um, you know, the world is much richer in terms of your opportunity to enjoy music when you're wealthy than when you have a society that's poor. Right? It's wealthy society created iPads, iPods, right? That you can listen to music everywhere and where, where band, with no support and no money, can go on the internet and record its music and have it heard everywhere. I mean, the, the level of opportunity that exists in a field like music, like a non-material field, right, is huge because 
of technology because of wealth. It didn't exist 200 years ago because the technology wasn't there. And why wasn't the technology not there? Because the wealth wasn't there and the science wasn't there. All of these support one another. So they come at it, again, from this perspective of it works. Um, I want to talk about one other uh, kind of uh, part of the libertarian movement, which I think is significant. And as you go out there and meet libertarians, you'll encounter uh, this group. So I don't want to be accused of, uh, of not including uh, one group. And that is um, the anarchists. These are the libertarians who believe that there should be no government. Mises, Hayek, uh, Friedman all believe there should be government. We'll talk about what, what the government's role is mentioned a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit more in a minute. But this school believes there should be no government, and again, not surprising, it's led for the most part by an economist, uh, a, a, an economist by the name of Maury Rothbard, uh, who I think at least at the end of his career was at the University of uh, Las Vegas. Um, and uh, this is the idea that <laughs> why stop at privatizing the post office and privatizing schools and private, let's privatize the police force and let's privatize the military. And let's have you know competing governments in a sense of competing police forces and 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 uh, and so on. Um, y you know this view this view is uh, is very strongly held out there. Um, th there's a big faction today uh, of of the libertarian movement, if there is such a thing, of people who call themselves libertarians who believe in anarchy. Uh, it's it's uh, a lot of the intellectuals today within the, the, the who call themselves libertarians are advocates for an anarchy. And it doesn't just manifest itself in no government, but a sudden hatred of government, a sudden resentment of government. So government is the biggest initiator force, the biggest violator of our rights, and we hate it and we resent it. And, and you know, there's a sudden element of truth there. There's a real element of truth, the biggest violator, the biggest imposer of force on your lives today is government. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, What's interesting is that it's, it also has an element of a real anti-U.S. government. For, for whatever reason, the, an, the anarchists tend to hate American government more than they hate any other government, uh, it, which, you know, I, I, don't ask me to explain. You'd have to ask one of them to explain. But it, it really is in there. And, and, you know, when I talk about Ron Paul, I, you know, there's a certain element of this in Ron Paul, which, uh, which I think is, is interesting. He's influenced by this part of the libertarian side of it, uh, this, this element of anarchist, anti-government, anti-U.S. government uh, is, is, I think, definitely there. Um, so what impact of, of these things has had on, on the American political scene? Um, not much. Not much. I mean, I think they've had an impact on people's ideas. They've had an impact on what people say, maybe even on what people think. But I'd say they've had almost no impact on what conservatives actually do um, in a sense of what they do when they get to power, when they get into a position of doing something. So many people in the Reagan administration, I think, would have considered themselves libertarian, economic libertarians in the sense of believing in a very, very minor role of government. But they didn't do much. The fact is the government under Reagan grew. It didn't shrink. Now, it grew at a slow rate. It was deregulated, but deregulation had already started under Jimmy Carter. Indeed, you know, again, not popular among conservatives, but the fact is that much of the benefits that Reagan uh, got were a result of deregulation that occurred under Jimmy Carter and under actual, actually under Ford. Ford is the one who really started, and then Carter, you know, it used to be that the government controlled the price of airplane tickets. Yep, and Jimmy Carter deregulated that. It used to be that the, that the government controlled the tariff for trucking, how much trucks could charge businesses for trucking. Jimmy Carter deregulated that. Financial uh, services were far more so broker. Broker fees used to be regulated. Um, how much a bank could pay on your saving account used to be regulated. Uh, it calls Regulation Q. Um, all of that was deregulated in the 70s, right? Under Joe Ford and Jimmy Carter, not under Reagan. So Reagan benefited from the fact that there was already some momentum towards deregulation. So with some deregulation, there was suddenly cutting taxes, um, but there was no shrinkage of government. Ronald Reagan came into office saying I was going to do away with the Department of Education. The Department of, Department of Education by the end of his second term was far bigger than it was when he started. 
Um, so the language of kind of the libertarian pro-free markets was there. The actions, not so much. And when we talk about RAND, I'll try to explain why that is. Um, the, uh, you see it in the verbiage even of the, of the, of the presidential candidates. I mean, Mitt Romney will say, you know, we need to shrink government dramatically, and I'm for individual rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And in the next sentence, he's telling you which industries he's going to subsidize and which industries he's going to penalize and how he's going to increase, how he's going to go after the Chinese and help the Americans and do all this and manipulate the economy. So it enters in certain areas, but it hasn't sunk in. So it seems like a lot of the candidates, the conservative candidates, need to talk the talk, but they don't actually walk the walk, unfortunately. I mean, I, and I won't even start with George Bush, because man, <laughs> where do you end if you start there? And, and it's not Bush's fault, right? He had a, cons he had a House and a Senate. There were all Republicans. Uh, there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of conservatives there. Uh, how many of you know, you've heard of Sarbanes-Oxley? I know you've got Sarbanes-Oxley, one of the biggest regulatory bills maybe since the 1930s was passed in 2002. Uh, probably cost the U.S. economy somewhere in the range of, I've seen estimates of around one and a half trillion dollars of shaved off of GDP. Um, a, a horrific, horrific, stupid law, which has caught, you know how many crooks it's caught? Because this came after Enron and WorldCom and all, all the fraud that happened. You know how many crooks it's caught? Zero. Bernie Madoff happened anyway. The housing crisis and, and whatever Wall Street shenanigans happened anyway. It did nothing. Anyway, you know how many conservatives voted against this in, uh, at the, in the Senate? None, because the thing passed 97 to zero. Conservatives talk the talk. They don't walk the walk when it comes to economic liberty. At least that's the history. And that's why, no matter who's in Congress, no matter who's in the White House, government has grown since the teens. For 100 years, government has only grown. Government intervention in the economy has only grown. In spite of that deregulation, there were other areas that were very quickly re-regulated and regulated anew and new taxes and new programs and more redistribution of wealth and more programs. And we saw that definitely under Bush, one of the most, uh, the biggest regulators and biggest, uh, you know, expanders of government programs since probably Lyndon B. Johnson. Right. Okay, so let's, let's sum up quickly here. Um, libertarians stand for economic freedom. They stand for individual freedom. So quickly on the social issues. Libertarians generally, their general principle is live and let live. You know, none of your business. I should be able to do whatever I want to do as long as I don't hurt you, as long as I don't violate your rights. It's not the goal of government to legislate morality. It's not the goal of government to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body. This is why you will, you will see that, you know, libertarians will advocate for legalization of drugs, legalization of prostitution. They will tend to be pro-abortion, and they will tend to be, um, you know, in these days, pro-gay marriage, right? So they, they will deviate from the conservative message on all of those, and indeed from mainstream America quite a bit on, on, on many of those. But, you know, and, and you've seen it. Ron Paul's always pushed on the drugs issue. He says he'd legalize marijuana, but what he really, really believes is that all drugs should be legalized. And I think you can make a really solid argument for that. It's interesting that that the founder of, maybe the founder of modern conservatism, uh, William F. Buckley, uh, towards the end of his life, uh, believed in uh, drug legalization, but not because of an individual freedoms issue. He believed in drug legalization from a utilitarian perspective. He believed it created too much crime and created too many people in jail. And therefore, just from an efficiency perspective, it didn't make any sense. The libertarians believe in it, not just from an efficiency perspective, but from an individual kind of liberty perspective. So their view is, again, and I'm putting the anarchists aside because I think the anarchists are very different and let's keep them to the side. Um, I think the mainstream libertarian position generally in politics is um, as long as you're not violating somebody else's rights, you should be able to do pretty much anything you want to do. It's not the role of government to tell you what you can and cannot do. Right? Live and let live. And it, that boils down to a principle um, which you could probably, you know, uh, bring back to the formulation to Ayn Rand. Maybe there were other thinkers that came up with similar formulations. But the principle of non-initiation of force. The idea that as long as you're not using force on somebody else, you should be able to do whatever you want to do. That's the principle that, that libertarians 
and in politics that objectivists, Ayn Rand would hold, the non-initiation of force principle. And that the role of government, the role of government, is to prevent the initiation of force and to retaliate when that force is initiated. So when somebody, you know, runs at me with a club to try to beat my head in, ideally the role of government is to step in, handcuff him, and take him to jail before he gets to me. Now, and if he's already clubbed me, then the idea is it shouldn't be my responsibility to chase after him. We want a specialized force, a police force, to chase him, get him, put him in jail. That's the role of government. When, you know, and again, military, so three functions, military, police, judiciary, that's it. And really, they're all involved in extracting force from society. Now, why do libertarians hold this as a first principle? Because they do. <laughs> because that's what they believe in. And we'll see that this is Rand's biggest objection here, because she believes you need a philosophical foundation. You can't just start with politics. Politics is an outcome, not the end. It's the end game. It's not the beginning. It's not the be all, end all. Libertarians believe in a big tent. They, as we said, include anarchists. They include some people willing to compromise on the role of government. But they also philosophically include utilitarians. They include uh, Catholic priests. They include um, Kantians, you know, Kant's philosophy. They include, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, natural rights. They include all kinds of philosophies. They have, libertarianism has nothing to say about how you come to the principle of non-initiation of force. It's just as long as you accept it, you're okay. Okay? So let me flip here. This is a good, good transition to Ayn Rand, because Ayn Rand disagrees. Rand claims that the reason we can't hold on, that we can't win the battle for limited government, the, for this capitalist economy, the reason we can't win it is because most people don't care about economics. Economics is not what life's about. It's not just about wealth. It's not just about how much GDP we can create or what kind of iPhone we could get. But it's much more, there are much more important values, that there are much more important things involved here. That people indeed don't vote their pocketbook. If they voted their pocketbook, we would have capitalism in America today. Because clearly capitalism is better for your pocketbook than is state intervention, statism. We've got, the economics have been done on that, right? We've got great economists, you know, by the way, Hayek and Friedman won Nobel Prizes, it's not just Krugman. Um, we've had lots of, lots of economists who've shown free markets work. The libertarians have done that, right? People don't vote their pocketbook. People want to believe that what they're doing is right. It's just. It's fair. It's good. People care about moral values. And ultimately what drives politics is not economics. It's morality. Even the challenge between individualism and collectivism, which is what seems to spur collect uh, the, the conservatives and the and the libertarians, but neither the conservatives, in Rand's view, neither the conservatives nor the libertarians have defended individualism. Because the question is why? Why shouldn't we view people as groups? And indeed, I would argue, Rand would argue, that most conservatives are collectivists. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll give you Rick Santorum. What is the unit, the unit of morality, the unit of politics, the unit of economics for Rick Santorum? The family, not the individual. He has a long speech in which, I think it's an interview, in which he says individual happiness is not the goal. This is where I think he departs dramatically from the founders. The family is the goal. The solidity of the family, the, however you want to define it. That's collectivism. Whenever you, the, goal, the unit of measurement is more than one person, is a group, it's collectivism. And of course that leads to policy, right? If the unit is the family, now it's not about individual freedom, it's about what's good for the family. And if I can outlaw divorce, maybe that's good for the family, so I'll outlaw divorce. 
The, the standard becomes completely different. And this is the problem conservatives face, is they, they don't have a defense of individualism. But neither do the libertarians. Because neither conservatives nor libertarians want to challenge what's at the root of collectivism, according to Rand. And what's at the root of collectivism is the morality of altruism. Now, what is altruism? Acor again, everything I'm saying is according to, to Rand. Altruism is not being nice to other people. Being nice to other people is just being benevolent. Altruism is not helping other people necessarily. Altruism is the idea, the philosophy that says, the morality that says, that the well-being of other people is your primary moral responsibility. So when you think about the good, the good is what I can do for other people, not what I can do for myself. Altruism versus egoism or self-interest. So the unit is other people. Immediately that's non-individualistic. It's about others. It's not about self. It's not about pursuing your happiness, right? Remember the Declaration of Independence says, it doesn't say you have a right to, uh, you know, be your brother's keeper, uh, go and help your fellow man, be Mother Teresa. No, it says pursue happiness. That's pretty selfish of the founders, right? And you have an inalienable right that cannot be taken away by anybody to pursue happiness. So, at the root of collectivism, Rand tells us, is altruism, is this notion of sacrifice, that virtue comes from sacrifice. You know, I like to tell the story of Bill Gates. Right? Bill Gates made gazillions of dollars during the 1990s and 2000s with Microsoft. And what did we think of him morally while he was making all his money? Now, we thought he was a great businessman, but what did we think he was, a, you know, Mother Teresa or Bill Gates on the same axis? No. Right? Mother Teresa is a saint. He's like, eh, he's a businessman. He's out to make money. Morally, we don't think much of him at all. Okay, so he retires, and he sets up a foundation, and he's giving it away. Ooh, now he's a good guy. Now he's moral, because he's giving it away. And I could guarantee him sainthood. Now, I'm not a Catholic, and I haven't talked to the Pope, but I think this would work. Right? He could get sainthood if he gave it all away, and if you moved into like a hut or a tent or something, <laughs> right? And if he bled a little bit and showed some suffering, that would help too. It's true. Not my moral code. Other people chose it. But this is true. So in this country, we don't admire ethically the creation of wealth. The creation of wealth, eh. We admire when we give it away. I, I actually, a year ago, about a year ago, I gave a talk here at, in Charleston. There was a luncheon event and I, uh, that was sponsored by the Citadel Business School uh, that honored uh, local business leaders. And it was, it was, they got awards, and I can't remember who exactly what, how the sponsorship worked, but I, I was the keynote speaker. And, uh, but everybody went up and introduced the businessmen who were getting the awards, and it was fascinating. Because, and it, was, and it fit right into my thesis, it was perfect. They spent two minutes describing their business achievements, the wealth they created, the employment they created, you know, the great standard of living they provided for their family and for themselves. And then they spent 15, 20 minutes describing their philanthropy and their community service. I mean, that is just bizarre. It's bizarre. Now, why is that? When Bill Gates made gazillions of dollars, how much did he help all of us? We all bought his products. Did he help us? Did he make us better? By a huge amount. By amount, many, many multiples of how much money he made. He helped us. He helped poor people all over the world. The fact that Microsoft has standardized software all over on computers, made networking possible, ultimately makes the internet possible in the form that we have today, and ultimately has benefited people all across the world, billions of people, many, many folds over what he actually earned. I believe he helped many, many more people in a much more profound way than when he gives it away. I, I think there's no question. And I think there's no question that under Microsoft he helped many, many more people in a more profound way than Mother Teresa ever, ever did. But what's the difference? 
He earned a return on helping them. He made money in the process. He helped himself by helping other people. That is unacceptable. That's why when he stopped making money and he just gave it away, even though he's helping fewer people and not as well, he's, good, he's a good guy. That's what altruism demands. It demands that you give without the expectation of getting. That's what sacrifice is, right? Sacrifice is giving and not getting. Sacrifice is lose-win, right? You lose, somebody else wins. At least on this earth as we understand it. That's what it means, right? Trade, which is what Bill Gates did, is what? When I trade something with you, I, I sell you a car and you pay me $20,000. Who lost? I won because the car was worth less than 20000 to me, so I made a little bit of a profit, right? And you won because the car was worth more than $20,000. That's why you're willing to give up the 20000 Win, win. All voluntary trades, the intention at least, now they don't always work like that. You sometimes buy a lemon. But all trades are intended to be win-wins. Win-win. From a perspective, in our culture, nah. Win-lose, all right. If somebody lost, it must be good. I mean, that's bizarre. But that's what altruism demands. And then when we, s and then if it's okay to sacrifice, no, if it's the epitome of virtue to sacrifice, then how can we complain when our taxes go up? All government's trying to do is help somebody. They're trying to get us to give more so that somebody else is better off, supposedly. Right? How can we complain when people are being regulated? What do we know about self-interest? What are we, the, the flip side of altruism is our perception of self-interest. What do we think of self-interested people? If I say that person's selfish, what do, what do we think immediately? Without even thinking, what comes to our mind? Bad. bad. He's bad. If he's self-interested, he's bad. He's probably, why is he bad? Because he's probably lying, cheating, stealing, right? He's Bernie Madoff. Right? So what a businessman, what's capitalism about? What's business about? It's about making money and making great products, but the products you want to make. Right? I, I, I love the iPhone example because, uh, you know, Steve Jobs made a lot of money on these, right? Profit margin is about 60%. If you really cared about me, he'd sell it cheaper. But he doesn't. <laughs> he wants to make money. But he also, how many, how many uh, you know, customer surveys did he did before he designed this? Zero. None. He created what he wanted to create. And he figured I'd like it. But he did what he wanted. Steve Jobs was a self-interested, call him selfish businessman. All businessmen are. That's, the, that's why we're so embarrassed by them. That's why we only spend two minutes describing their business activities, because it's selfish. We all know it. We know capitalism is about a bunch of people pursuing self-interest. Adam Smith understood that in 1776. The baker doesn't bake the bread to make you better off. He doesn't care about you. He makes the bread to make a living. And he gives you good customer service, not because he loves you, but because that's how he sells more bread. Right? That's the reality. We all, are in the business world, are after self-interest. And yet self-interest is... Lying, stealing, cheating. I mean, they're going to take from me. Of course we want regulations. We want government bureaucrats who are not self-interested, right, because they're, they're, they're for the common good, right, to, to monitor this and to, and to make sure I use, in the article I think you all read, I used elevator inspectors, right? Don't you feel a lot more comfortable going into elevators and seeing that little thing that a government inspector has said? <laughs> because we know, we know that if the government didn't inspect elevators, elevator makers would make elevators that killed us. Because that's how businessmen make money, by killing their clients and customers. I mean, it's insane. But, but if you don't spell it out, well, of course, elevator, they're selfish. They'll try to cut corners and make a quick buck. But making a quick buck is going to destroy them. That's not rational. That's not really self-interested. OK, I need to speed up a little bit. But so you can see how there's a conflict between capitalism, free markets, and altruism. People vote their altruism. They don't vote their understanding of markets. They want to be good, and, and, and Obama understands this really, really well. Notice how he's phrasing this election. This is not an election about the economy, not from a GDP perspective. This is an election about fairness. 
about the kind of economy and the kind of world we want to live in in the future. He's about the vision thing, and he's got it. He's framing this as a, an election about morality, not about economics, because he loses in economics. But he has a chance of winning in the morality. This is what Rand challenges. She says, yes, you economists, you're all right. This, you know, the, the way you've described the economy, particularly von Mises, it works, that's right. And everybody who's willing to work is better off. But that's not the reason that capitalism is a good thing. That's not a reason to be an individualist and to advocate for freedom. The reason is that it's moral. But she can only say that because she rejects altruism. She can only say that because she's willing to challenge every secular philosopher of the last, you know, 1,000 years, more, 2,000 years, since Aristotle, with a few exceptions here and there, who basically said that your purpose in life is to sacrifice for others. She's willing to, to challenge, you know, what many consider the Judeo-Christian tradition of morality, which is altruism. So she is an advocate for a different morality. She is an advocate for the morality of self-interest. She says the purpose in life, your purpose in life, each one of you, is to pursue your life, to make your life the best that it can be, to live the most flourishing, successful, happy life that you can. And by the way, and I can't prove it now, but if you want, you can ask me in the Q&A, that doesn't involve lying, cheating, stealing, because lying, cheating, stealing turned out to be incredibly self-destructive. It involves leading a rational, long-term life of honesty and a sense of justice and, and, and integrity. Okay. And if you, know, if you capture, if you believe in a morality of self-interest, a morality that says, my life's the standard. I don't want to live for somebody else. I'm not your servant. I don't owe you anything unless we're trading. I don't owe my life to any group, to any other individual. I am here for me. And yes, I want to trade with you guys in all kinds of ways. Some of them material, some of them spiritual. Right? But I don't want you to sacrifice for me. I don't want to give me, you to give me stuff I haven't earned. And I don't want to give you stuff you haven't earned. I want this to be win-wins. So that kind of morality, that kind of morality, is the, she believed, is the only morality consistent with the founding of this country. Because it's the only morality consistent with the sentence in the Declaration about the inalienable right to your life, each one of your lives. And the founders were talking about individual lives. They weren't talking about the American life or the group's life. Or they were talking about individuals. Your liberty. It's your ability to think what you want to think and do what you want to do and pursue your values that you choose. Not that somebody else chooses for you. Not that the group decides is in a common good. But what you decide is in your good. And, of course, in the most selfish political statement in human history, to pursue your own happiness. That's the essence of our morality. It's about pursuit of happiness. Well, that links up completely with a political system that says, go pursue your happiness. Think about an individual that's only concerned about the pursuit of his own happiness. Right? And, you know, is consistent about that. What kind of government does he want? Does he want a government that sits on his shoulder like a paternalistic mother and he says, don't do that, don't eat that, oh, no, no, trans fats, that's no good for you. You know, don't go into that elevator and inspector wasn't there. You know, don't go west, young man. Don't take risks. Don't, you know, don't invent an iPhone. Invent this, you know, what they call a camel is a horse created by a government committee. Um, you know, that, you don't, do you want to like, no, somebody who wants to pursue their own life, to pursue their own interests, to pursue their own passions, to pursue their own values, to make of themselves the best that they can be, that person wants to be left alone. He doesn't want people telling him what to do. And not just telling him. Government doesn't just tell, right? Government has a big gun. Government puts a gun at your back and says, don't eat trans fats, or you go to jail. Uh, no, no, they haven't got, well, trans fats in New York. I, think, I, think, I still think you can eat them in, in uh, Charleston. 
but uh, you, you probably can't smoke here, even in private property where people might want you to smoke. You still can't smoke. You go to jail. If I own a restaurant, why should I not allow smoking? You don't like smoking, don't come. It's very simple. Private property, right? I can, I can smoke in my own house. Why can't I smoke in my own business? Same thing, private property. If you don't like my business, don't walk in. I certainly, I know my wife would never walk into a business where there was smoke. She hates it. Fine. Her rights, and now business owners' rights, both to being protected. She doesn't have to go into the store. The store owner doesn't have to let her in if he doesn't like her, if she's smoking. Right? That's freedom. <laughs> freedom is the ability to do what you want to do with your stuff. As long, again, as you're not hurting somebody. Yeah. Um, so that, so, so Rand views that as a, as a core foundational idea, the morality of self-interest for the establishment of limited government. You're not going to get the limited government of the founders. You're not going to be able to sustain that without a new morality, without the rejection of altruism. And you cannot get the new morality without, and I don't have time to really get into this, without something even more fundamental than that. So Ayn Rand said she was an advocate for capitalism because she was an advocate of individualism. She was an advocate of individualism because she was an advocate of self-interest. And she was an advocate of self-interest because she was an advocate of reason. So even when it comes to a more fundamental philosophical point, she believes that unless, unless we agree that reason is the standard for knowledge, we'll never get the rest. Yeah. So the fundamental, I think, difference between you know, the von Mises type libertarian and Rand is that the libertarian is willing to accept any philosophical foundation. Rand accepts only a particular philosophical foundation and argues that without it, you can't get what the libertarian wants to get, which is that limited government. Okay. Uh, leave you with this question, you know, which I think of. What do you think the founders were? Were the founders conservatives? If they were conservatives, what were they trying to conserve? Were the founders libertarians? I mean, it didn't really exist as a, as a thought, but were they... Were they consistent with libertarians? Founders, I mean, they couldn't have been objectivists because there was no objectivism back then, but what were they? Um, and how would they have defined themselves back then? Because everybody wants them, right? We all want the founders because in, in this country, liberals want them, the conservatives want them, you know, because there's a, we all have a healthy respect for them. We all have this emotional tie to them. But, but think about it, you know, uh, they were revolutionaries. They were radicals. They were way out there. If this is where the mainstream world was, the founders were way, way out there. And this is, I think, the most important contribution. This is what, what makes America special and what, if we don't recapture, we're lost. Uh, everywhere in the world, before the founding of this country, your life as an individual, your body as an individual, your soul as an individual, belonged to someone else. It belonged to the tribe. It belonged to the king. It belonged to the Pope. It belonged to some other group. The world was a collectivistic world, all of it. There were no exceptions. What's unique about this country is that it's for the first time it was founded on a truly radical revolutionary principle. This is what the revolution is about, is a rejection of that idea. You do not belong to anybody but yourself. This country was founded on the principle, if you will, of self-ownership. That's what individual rights mean. You own yourself. And that is, yes, there were thinkers that led up to that, from John Locke and the Enlightenment thinkers, but there was no political movement, no political movement that articulated that except for the founders. And that's what makes the American Revolution the greatest revolution by far. There's no other revolution that comes close. The fact that uh, Ginsburg, a Supreme Court judge of the United States, I don't know if you heard this, but she in an interview recently said that other countries shouldn't look to the United States Constitution as a model, but they should look at South Africa's and Canada's. Um, I mean, that's just absurd. But, you know, this is the greatest country that ever was because, ever in the history of mankind, because of that founding principle, because of that founding idea. And that's the founding principle that we need to recapture, whether you, whether you want to recapture it under conservatism or under something other label. If we could capture that notion that we own ourselves, that our lives is ours, 
to live as we please, to pursue, founders put it, to pursue our own happiness, then the future is ours. If we lose it, then the future is lost. We will go down that road to serfdom and the road that Atlas Shrugged uh, lays out, the road, uh, the road to collectivistic destruction. And on that gloomy note, thank you all. Well, we're back here with Dr. Yaron Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, Dr. Brook is willing and more than able to take any of your questions. Uh, I just want to point out that next week um, we have the great uh, distinction of being able to have uh, General Ed Meese, who is the architect of the Reagan era. So we look forward to having him. But right now, Dr. Yaron Brook, first question. Yes, sir, Mr. Mellon, Cadet uh, Mellon. Our first speaker, uh, Alfred Gregory, said that uh, one of the basic tenets of conservatism was a belief in God, and uh, objectivism would not wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, what replaces the belief in God in, in conservatism or in this uh, political view? Well, I mean, I agree that it is a tenet of conservatism. That, that's why I would argue that, it, that objectivism is not conservatism. As long as that is a tenet, it's a problem. Um, what replaces a belief in God? Reason. That is knowledge, science. Um, so, in, so I'll give you my view of the belief in God. Take it for what it's worth. Um, I think as human beings, we needed to believe in God. God w was an important way in which we understood reality. So. Uh, it, when the Egyptians lived in Egypt and the Nile rose, and then it, they didn't understand that. So they said, the, 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 the river's a god. And they didn't understand where the moon was from and the sun was from, and they became gods. And you see that all primitive societies basically created the same gods because they put the concept of God into those things they didn't understand. And then there was this great innovation. Well, let's have one category. Instead of having lots of these things, some of which we now understand, right, because we, we've increased our knowledge, Let's have one pot in which we can, and call it one God, right? And that's, that's the Jews, if you will, who come up with the idea of one God. And that, ex that holds within it everything we don't understand. And I think there's, just, there's a lot of legitimacy to that because as a human race, we're still cognitive, we're still young, we're still trying to deal with the world and try to understand it. But I would argue that once we discover the scientific method, once we see that everything that we thought was unexplainable is then explained. And then, yeah, there are more things that are unexplainable, but we now have the method to explain it, i.e., reason. The ability to comprehend reality, to understand what's going on, and to figure out cause and effect within it. We know we can do that. Then I, th I think that the concept becomes meaningless. The concept is not necessary anymore. Uh, and you know, the other aspect of, of faith uh, that people latch onto is morality. Uh, without God, there is no morality, is the idea. Well, I, I, I just don't see that. I don't see the logic in that. Uh, morality is a concept that existed well before there were gods. So, you know, in, in societies that didn't accept this particular god or that particular god that had many gods, uh, morality, people have disagreed about morality because they've derived it differently from different sources. Gods seem to disagree about morality. You can't get two gods to agree on what morality is. Um, and I think Ayn Rand, again, solves that by providing us a morality that is consistent with us as a biological entity, with who we are, with our nature. That is fundamentally, as a living being, we want to live. And that's the beginning. And once you understand that, you want to live as a biological entity, the question of morality has to solve is, okay, what do you need to do in order to live? But not just live, but to thrive. And that's morality. That's all morality needs to do is answer that question. How do we as human beings thrive? Yes, Mr. Faust. Good afternoon, Faust. Um, in history, haven't we seen reason try to be used to direct government before with the French Revolution? And didn't we see that pretty much utterly fall apart? I mean, yes. just using reason by itself. So one of the great tragedies, one of the great tragedies of conservatism, and by the way, Hayek is probably the most, is, is incredibly responsible for this. <laughs> this is why, at the end of the day, I don't like Hayek, right? Is that we blame reason for these things, when reason has nothing to do with them. Um, so we try to say, 
reason leads to disaster. Um, human beings, are, uh, uh, we have original sin. We're, we're fallible. We're, 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 we, we don't really know anything. We make mistakes. We don't get it. We're kind of mediocre. We're not that good. Um, so what we need is freedom. Right? I mean, that's just a bizarre argument in my view. Reason misapplied can cause real damage, no question. You can, build, you can build an atomic bomb, or you can build an atomic energy generator. Both are applications of reason. And building an atomic bomb in a lot of contexts is a very good thing. It ends the war in Japan very quickly. I'm all for that. But you can apply, you can, you can apply the products of reason in a bad way. Now, to claim that the French Revolution used reason is to reverse history. The French Revolution has nothing to do with reason. The French Revolution is one big emotional orgy. I mean, it is. I mean, think about these guys, too. They, they're not applying reason. It's about violence. It's about force. It's about, it's about hatred. I mean, it's the opposite of the American Revolution. To me, the American Revolution is all about reason. I mean, what does it say in the Jefferson Memorial? It says, and I can't remember the exact quote. I wish I could. But it says something I'm paraphrasing. Bring everything before reason, even the existence of God. Right? Even, so everything before reason, that is the essential. If you look at Adams, if you look at Madison, if you look at Washington, if you look at Jefferson, reason is what they're all about. It's no accident 1776 is the peak of the age called the age of reason. In my view, the French Revolution is the end of the age of reason. <laughs> it's the refutation of the age of reason. Now, it's true that a dictator cannot reason an economy, right? And this is Hayek's critique, right? He says, economy is so complex that no one human being can... But that's not the argument. The argument is that because each one of us has reason that's different, that's uniquely ours in terms of the values we pursue, in terms of what we want to do in our lives, the passions we have, the professions we have, the products we want to buy, each one of us is going to behave in a way that a central manager can't predict. Of course he can't, because we have free will. And therefore, an economy is going to have consequences and going to move in ways that no one person can predict. That's not a, that's not a, a problem with reason. That, that's just a fact of life. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's pro-individual reason. You see, I think we're all capable of being good, capable of being just, capable of using our reason to fullest extent in pursuing our own lives. And the only society that we could establish that allows for that is a society of freedom, society that leaves us alone. To that. So I don't consider the French Revolution, I don't consider the communists as advocates for reason they claim to be, but their, their philosophy is incredibly unreasonable. See, I believe that communism is a faith. It's a faith that places believe in God, because they were atheists, so they didn't believe in God, with faith in the proletarian. But it's still faith. Where did they get, who decided what was true? Was it reason? No, it was Stalin. And where did Stalin get it? Whatever he felt like, from his pure emotion. So don't associate Nazism because they were secular with reason. Secularism doesn't equal reason. I know a lot of secular people. I know a lot of atheists who are, who are uh, the most unreasonable people I know in the world. They're complete emotionalists, whim worshippers, which I think the French Revolution was about. You know, they, they have nothing to do with reason. They've, they've replaced faith in God with faith in something else. Or with no faith, but they're not using this. They're using something else. You talk about Adams, and uh, Adams had a letter to his officers in October of 1798, and I'm just going to quote a small piece of it. Avarice, ambition, revenge, licentiousness would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. Yeah, so, I mean, Adams is right fundamentally. That is that I believe that in order to have good government, you have to have a good populace. You have to have a moral populace. I agree with that. What Adams is doing is what everybody did back then, right? And almost everybody, there were a few exceptions, Voltaire being maybe one. And that is they equated morality with religion. They couldn't conceive of morality independent of religion. So when he says morality, what he means is religion. He says morality and God, right? So he, he lumps them together because that's what everybody did. Even Jefferson who I think was the most secular of the Founding Fathers, couldn't get, wouldn't give up on the morality of Christianity, even though I think he gave up on a lot of Christianity. I don't know if you know, but Jefferson had uh, something called the Jeffersonian Bible, where he took the New Testament and cut out the good parts, 
and he just created his own Bible, which is just the stuff that he believed in. And so he cut out anything mystical. Jesus walking on water, uh, bread, or, you know, all the, all the miracles he cut out. And he kept the moral teaching, right? So the morality, because he believed that was the only way to get morality, which is unfortunate. I think it's the beginning. It's why, ultimately, the Constitution of America has been undercut. So I agree completely with Adams. And I take it one more step, actually, now that I think about it. I would say that the reason that we have not lived up to the Constitution and the Declaration, because we haven't, we've abandoned them, and we've abandoned them over the last hundred years in mass, is because the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, while being the greatest political documents in human history, they were, they were established on a foundation of quicksand. And the foundation of quicksand is the foundation of altruist morality, which none of the founding fathers were willing to challenge. They were willing to challenge everything in politics. They were the radicals of their times when it came to politics. But they were conventional when it came to morality. What we need to do, what I believe Ayn Rand has done, is taken those same political principles and put them on a solid foundation, solid moral philosophical foundation, so that when we go through the next revolution, hopefully it won't be armed this time, then, you know, we can sustain the Constitution of the, and the Declaration forever. Because I think they're worthy of sustaining forever. Cadet Salmasco. Um, sir, you mentioned libertarians and that they believe, they view capitalism, that capital, capitalism should be the prevailing order because it works. They don't put it in moral terms. That's right. Do you think... Do libert would li libertarians put it in, in moral terms? Would they be in a position to, or would they say that goes too far? Some do and some don't. So again, you know, libertarians, it's a big tent. And there are a lot of people there. And some, some would claim it's natural rights theories. They would, they would, what the founding fathers kind of, but, but again, that doesn't really get to morality. Natural rights is more about politics than it is about, more. it's kind of a bridging concept between morality and politics. They would try to use Kantian morality, which I think is the exact opposite of capitalism, but they would distort it in a way, you know. They would use utilitarianism, probably the most popular. Most libertarians are utilitarians. The great, you know, it works. Right? What's utilitarianism? It's a morality that says whatever works is good. Yeah, but, I, but it's a, that's a slippery slope because, uh, you know, you could come up with all kinds of scenarios where it works to penalize some people in order to benefit other people which is what the liberals do all the time. Liberals also utilitarian, it's not to differentiate. But, but what libertarians are trying to do, and this is the great debate between objectivists and libertarians, they're trying to have the cake and eat it too, right? They're trying to have capitalism without having to take a stand on morality. I think they have to take a stand. I think the only stand they can take is Ayn Rand's stand, because I don't think there's another morality that's consistent with capitalism. I think it's the only morality, morality of self-interest. And we can argue about the details and you know, you know, the particular virtues, are, and that's not the point. The point is a morality of self-interest, a Aristotelian-based morality of self-interest is the only way you can ground morally capitalism. Can you be, can you be a religious, a person who has a deep belief in God and still an objectivist? Not consistently. Not consistently. You can certainly accept a lot of objectivism while still believing in God. I have people who sign their emails to me, Christian objectivist, and my view is that's good. They've accepted some of them. That's good. I wish they'd accept it all, but um, we believe, as objectivists, we believe that everything, we believe in Jefferson's statement. Everything, the standard for everything is reason. The standard for everything is logic and rational thought. And you know, as, if we accept that, if we accept that everything needs to be placed before reason and rationality, then I think you can be an objectivist. And we might disagree on this point or that point, whether it fits or not. But that is the key. The key is consistency with regard to reason. And I think only if you believe that can you then accept that, that man is a rational being, which is an Aristotelian term which we accept, and therefore is capable of, of, of pursuing his own self-interest in a rational kind of way. So, and, and therefore, we can believe in capitalism. So I think the sequence is reason, self-interest, capitalism. Now, you talked about Jefferson. I'm, yeah. I'm, and the Jeffersonian agrarians hated big government. They were totally yeah. against big government. But they even, ha but secondly, they hated big industry. A lot of people say that Ayn Rand's philosophy, objectivism, 
leads to techno-fascism. That's bizarre. I mean, there's my only, I mean, because fascism, fascism is the negation of individual will, right? Fascism is placing the dictator's will, however you want to call it. The dictator it. being, of course, the, the owners and runners of the... Yeah, but the only way the owners of the runners of corporations could be dictators is if you give them guns and you allow them to use them. The anarchists might be for that, but I'm not. Um, so the only people with guns in, my, in, in an objectivist world is government. And corporations can go big, but so what? So, um, so, this, so the question I usually get, so she can't be a fascist, because fascist, again, is the will of somebody with a gun over you. If you, if you work for a corporation and you don't like what they do, what can you do? Go find another job. Go work for somebody else. In a capitalist marketplace, time and time again, we've seen that plenty of jobs. There's more jobs than people. Capitalism has a negative unemployment rate. So in the 19th century, when we came closest to capitalism in America, people, millions of people emigrated into this country in spite of the fact that we were small population-wise, and they all found jobs. <laughs> How did that happen? Because capitalism has a negative unemployment rate when people, when people are really free. Everybody who wants to find a job can find a job, including starting their own job, starting their own business. So I don't, so I don't believe, so you can't put fascism and Ayn Rand together. Now, what about this notion that in an Ayn Rand world, in a capitalism world, what you get is big business, massive monopolies who control everything. Again, there's no evidence of this in history. There's no evidence that this, this would happen. And there's not. So let's take, uh, we talked about this last night, let's take uh, the few examples in American history where industry has grown, where a company has grown so big as to dominate an industry. And the, the best example of that in, in American history, and by the way, when Jefferson, when Jefferson was alive, there were no big businesses. Right? I mean, he, d he disliked banks, he distrusted banks, but there were no big businesses because it was basically an agrarian society. The big businesses start around the 1830s, 40s, and really 1860s, 1870s. So in 1870s, Standard Oil, J.D. Rockefeller's business, had 94% of the oil refining capacity in the United States. I, you could quibble whether it was 90 or 94. You could ask, uh, if Folsom comes back, you can ask him, he's the expert. Um, so what, right? So if you take an economics class, they teach you the prices will go up and quality will go down. Fact is, prices went down every single year and quality went up every single year. Every single year, go look at the records. Why? Because Rockefeller understood two things. One, there's always competition. Even when you control 90% of the market, there's competition. There's a little guy who will take and chew away at you and get you. And not only that, there's competition you can't even imagine or can't even believe. Because who was, who was Rockefeller's ultimate competitor? I love this story. Because it's a twist you will never. What was Rockefeller selling when he was refining oil? Anybody know? Rockefeller saved the whales. Do you know Rockefeller saved the whales? Not regulations, not greens, not Greenpeace. Because Rockefeller sold kerosene. And kerosene was used for lighting. What was used for lighting before kerosene? Whale oil. The whaling industry was destroyed by Rockefeller. Don't let the Greens get that one from me, right? <laughs> Who destroyed kerosene? Who was Rockefeller's ultimate competitor? Thomas Edison, by inventing electricity. So he understood competition could run from anywhere, so you better be good, and you better be on your toes all the time. Steve Jobs understands this. Bill Gates understands this. That's why when the Justice Department went after Bill Gates, they went after him for offering us a product for Free. That was his sin. He offered Internet Explorer for free. That's why they, they, he was creating a monopoly. He was undercutting his competition because Netscape was charging. And this is before your time. And Netscape was charging for the Internet, for the, for the uh, what do you call it, uh, browser, and Microsoft was not. That's why the Justice Department went after This uh, screwed up our antitrust laws. Are. Now, okay, so Rockefeller, go back to Rockefeller. The second thing he understood is one, there's always competition. Second, if you drive the price of oil really, really low, people will discover new uses for it. And you'll expand your market beyond kerosene. So why do you think we have an internal combustion engine that runs on gasoline? Because by the time the internal combustion engine was invented, it, he could refine oil so cheaply that he could fuel the internal combustion engine. And that's why they chose gasoline. So, that was his industry. By the way, by the time he was broken up, I think it was in the 20s or the teens, he only had about 20% of the market because competitors. 
So there's no such thing. Competition is always, if you lived in the, if in the 1990s and somebody had told you that 15 years from now, Apple would be bigger than Microsoft, you would have institutionalized them. I mean, that was nuts. I, I'm an Apple, longtime Apple user. And I always considered Apple's gonna be a small niche company. It always was, always will be. And why did Apple become bigger than Microsoft? Because of iPods. Who, I mean, this is the beauty of the marketplace. You could never predict any of this stuff. So big business is an interim step. It's a step, you know, every small business wanted to be a big business. Big business, if it doesn't stay toned and, and efficient and aggressive and competitive, becomes small very quickly. Next question over here. Uh, Mr. Lacey. Yes, I, I thought it was interesting when you were talking about the history of human society essentially being a collectivist one. I think we can look at anthropologically, tribe, chiefdom, state, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I also thought it was interesting you talked about the new morality being based on you know how do we survive and thrive. And with those two things in mind, I don't think the new morality, even though it fits with capitalism, I don't think it excludes collectivism because I feel one can join a society for the purpose of thriving, for that security, or you know, you don't have to be looking out for everyone else, but you might join that collectivist society to get your own needs provided by the state. I don't think it's exclusive. Uh, so I think we have to be careful in how we may how, in our definitions. Okay. Okay. Collectivism doesn't mean being a member of something. The fact that you all belong to Citadel or students at the Citadel doesn't mean make you collectivists, right? Collectivism means placing of the group above yourself. The group is more important than you. In a sense, the group owns you. So think of the tribe. Nobody cared about Michael in the tribe. You were cog in the machine. And if the tribal leader, or the tribal witch doctor needed you to, to, uh, to, to die in, uh, for the sake of the tribe, then so be it. Then you were sacrificed for the sake of the tribe. You were nothing. You were a cog. Uh, Think of the Nazis. If the na Nazis didn't care about Michael, you know, even if you were Aryan, they didn't care about you, right? As long as you serve the machine, the Aryan nation, ultimately Hitler, right? You're okay, but if you didn't, wipe you up, no problem. And that's collectivism. Collectivism is the notion that you don't exist as an individual other than to serve the group. Individualism says you exist to serve you. And as part of that, you might choose to, to join a group because it serves your interest to serve a group, join a group. But, um, but not, as a, not as a pawn, not as a cog, but as an equal member of a group in which you're pursuing your values while others pursue their values. So, you know, I have a family. I don't believe that I, because I have a family, I'm a collectivist. I have a family because it's in my rational self-interest to have a family. I enjoy it. It serves my values. It's great. And we trade within the family. I view all my relationship as fundamentally trade relationships. I don't sacrifice for my kids. I don't. I mean, I think it's an insult to tell your kids you sacrifice for them. Right? Because it means they're not that important. So if I sacrifice, let's say, uh, you know, I, I, uh, Johnny, I sacrificed for you today. I stayed with you instead of going to movies. That means you're not that important to me. See, it's the exact opposite. I say, no, I stay with you because you're more important to me than the movies. That's not a sacrifice. That's a trade. We do that every day. We choose higher values instead of uh, over lower values. My children are way up there. Anything I do for them, almost anything I do for them, is, is I'm happy to do because it, it's good for me. Right? So I don't believe in sacrifice in any aspect of life. I don't believe in lose situations. I only believe in win-win situations or win situations. Um, so I, think, I don't think individualism is against joining groups. Now, it should be against joining certain types of groups. Joining groups where you give up your freedom. And let me, let me define freedom, because definitions are important. Freedom, politic, from a political perspective, freedom is a lack of coercion. Freedom is where nobody's coercing you. So signing a contract is not giving up freedom. It's choosing to restrict your behavior based on some prearranged arrangement that you can extract yourself from under certain circumstances, and it expires in certain circumstances. That's not giving up freedom. But when you... Uh, when you have a president who tells you that you have to give him tithing of 50% of your income, that's, that's an attack on your freedom. Because try not giving it to him. And a big gun shows up and takes you to jail. So coercion, force, that's what freedom is the negation of. 
Freedom is the, is the absence of coercion. We are free when we, are f when we have nobody forcing us to do things we don't want to do. Next question, uh, Cadet Thomas. So just a second ago you said that uh, in an objectivist society the only people with guns should be the government. But then what, what would be uh, to stop the government from abusing that power? No, I, 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 if I said that I didn't mean it. <laughs> I'd say the only people using the guns on other people should be the government, unless it's a literal emergency in a, a, of an act of self-defense. I have no problem people owning guns. Um, I, I don't think it's the most important thing. I'm not a huge gun rights person, but I'm for, you know, you should be able to own a gun. As long as it's a gun that is primarily self-defense, so I do think there's a limit. I don't think you should be able to own a, a nuke bomb or, or, or a tank. Some libertarians do. I mean, libertari again, there's a wing of the libertarian party that says, or libertarian movement that says you should own whatever. You know, if you, you should be able to buy a tank or, or a nuke or whatever. Uh, I don't believe that. I think you should only be allowed to own a defensive weapon. Um, and, uh, yeah, you should be able to. The problem, you know, the Constitution is interesting because the Constitution, uh, the, the Second Amendment is about owning a gun in order to <laughs> rebel against the government, right? But you couldn't do that today anyway, right? Because they have big weapons. I mean, that's just, unfortunately, that's the reality. So I, I, I do think that to the extent that we want to protect individuals' right to own a gun, it should be on the basis of, of uh, uh, self-defense, not on the basis of rebellion, because I, I just don't think rebellion is a realistic option. Um, but so yes, I, I, you know, government should be the, government's job is to monopolize the retaliatory use of force. So you shouldn't chase the criminal who's just attacked you. I mean, you really should. You shouldn't put your life in that. You know, that's the government's job. Now, if they're attacking you, you've got a gun. Pull it out and shoot them. Absolutely. Good Slater. Sir, uh, could you not have altruism within a system of individualism? So, like, have a government with, that's uh, focused on individualism, but then have like, you know, altruism at a personal level or through civil society? So this is, this is uh, actually Hayek's argument. Hayek advocated for Classic this. Question. Yes. Classic question. Yes, that, that somehow you could be altruistic in some aspects of your life and individualistic in a, And my argument is no, you cannot. And I don't see why you would be. Um, I, I think we strive towards consistency. We cannot have a personal ethical belief that's inconsistent with a political belief. I don't think that's an equilibrium. I don't think that's sustainable. Ultimately, the personal ethical belief will spill into politics and will infect it. And it's exactly what we saw in America. In America, we had a political system that was based on individualism, based on leaving people alone, based on, on, on individuals pursuing their own happiness. But the ethical belief of the people, particularly the new intellectuals who came into this country in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and brought progressivism in and so on, they undercut that by taking their personal ethical belief and spilling it over into government. And I just don't see the need for it. Why should I sacrifice anywhere in my life? Again, I don't sacrifice my kids. I don't sacrifice my wife. I love my wife. Why would I need the sacrifice for? Imagine coming to your wedding day and saying, honey, I don't love you. I'm marrying you because I'm sacrificing for you. <laughs> I mean, that's what it would really mean. It would mean marrying somebody you don't love. If you marry somebody you love, that's not a sacrifice. There's no sacrifice there. It's great. It's pursuing your own self-interest in the most wonderful way you can. So I just don't see, I, I, I think it's hurtful. And it, it's hurtful to think about altruism as good in any way. Because <laughs> I think it's evil. I think it's wrong. I think placing the well-being of other people above your own life is bad. Not just neutral, not just I don't like it, but bad. I'd use the E word, but it's politically incorrect, right? I think it's evil. I think you should like other people if they, if they have value, if they're good people. But liking, enjoying their friendship, enjoying their love, trading with them, doing stuff with them, being with them, that's not sacrifice. I mean, we've got our terminology all confused in there, I know, but it, it's important to be clear on what we mean by these things. Uh, Cadet Stewart? Would you say a good example of individualism in relation to a government would be uh, John Locke's theory of social contract? Yeah, but I don't believe in the contract part of it. But I certainly believe that, you know, certainly John Locke is the great, greatest political thinker, certainly in, you know, pre-20th century. Um, and, and I agree completely. I mean, the, the founders were Lockean, right? The fa you, you find more quotes of Locke in, in the, the Federalist Papers and in, in the founders' discussion 
than anybody else, including of the Bible. They, I mean, they are Lockeans, first and foremost. They are men of the Enlightenment. They read all this stuff. And Locke's uh, um, discovery of the idea of individual rights is one of the greatest discoveries in human history and makes individual freedom as a political concept possible. Without Locke, we don't have America, and we don't have many of the freedoms we take for granted today. So Locke, I, I, Locke is certainly a giant in, in his political theory. I think, again, he's conventional, more conventional when it comes to morality and when it comes to, to his beliefs. Uh, Cadet Mellon, and then we'll go to Cadet Selmaska. Uh, as mentioned, we have two parties that seem like they're fighting, both fighting for collectivism. Uh, what's our end game? <laughs> we, uh, well, the end game is to take over one of the parties and, and, uh, and change it. That's the end game. And I think we've got a better shot at the Republican Party because I think there, there are some conservatives, or there's a significant group of conservatives that are closer to my view of the world than there are any liberals who are close to my view of the world. And, but, I, but I think that has to be the end game. Now, I don't think you can get a my end game to my ideal society in my lifetime and maybe not in your lifetime. But we can certainly take steps in that direction. If we can start moving the conservative movement towards a greater respect for individualism. I, if, we can, if we can move them away from the Rick Santorum type of, of, of conservatism to a conservatism of, that respects free markets and respects the individual. You know, maybe it doesn't agree with everything I believe in. Maybe it still has somewhat of a role of government. Maybe it still wants to subsidize this or do that, but a lot less than what's being done today. And in the name of economic efficiency rather than the name of the family or something like that then, you know, th these steps are slow steps. I mean, there are only two ways of doing this. Either we do it slowly or there's a revolution, and I think we lose a revolution. I mean, they, they, we, they, we're outnumbered. So I'd rather, I'd rather believe in small steps because I think we have a chance of winning. On the other hand, I'll give you this, that if we don't move quickly, then the country is lost because you, there is a tipping point. I don't know if you've ever read a book called Tipping Point uh, by, um, anybody remember the name of the author? Uh, Gladwell, there's a book about, about, there's a certain point in society where you can't change stuff. It's, it's, in spite of free will, in spite of everything, it's just too late. I fear, now some people would argue we've already flipped on the tipping point, we've already reached it, but I, I would argue we haven't yet. And this is the tipping point in my view. Um, Americans are unique people in the world, and this you have to be a foreigner to appreciate. <laughs> but Americans are unique, and they're unique because of the founding. The founding is a unique event in human history. There is no other country that has a founding that is based on individualism. So American people have a spirit. It's not an idea, it's a spirit. Uh, Ayn Rand called it a sense of life, a feeling, an emotion. That's about, don't tread on me, leave me alone, I want my freedoms. They don't know what it means, they can't articulate it necessarily very well, they can't explain what, how it translates into policy. But they have this enough's enough. Big government is now good. And, and the best example of that in, in recent times is the Tea Party. I'm a huge fan of the Tea Party because of this. The Tea Party is an emotional response to big government. It's an emotional cry of enough is enough. We, we don't want this paternalistic government treading us on, on us anymore. They don't have an agenda. They don't know what they want. They want small government, but they don't know how to get there. They don't know what they want to shrink. If you ask them on specific programs, they all want to save Social Security and save this and save that. So they don't actually have a program. They don't actually have a philosophy to move them to where they need to be. But they know this is wrong. That's great. No other country has a Tea Party. And, and they've been harassed much more than the Americans have. So when we lose that spirit, we lose the chance to change this country. And that spirit is declining. It's in decline. It's been in decline for decades. Uh, because the erosion, because of public education, because the political culture, it's just being eroded. We need to latch onto that spirit of individualism. We need to cultivate it. We need to help it grow. And that's, that's the future. And, you know, I think that's more going to happen on, on the Republican kind of conservative side than it is on the liberal side. I certainly hope so. But I think your description of both of them as fundamentally collectivist, statist, right, in, in state intervention is true. And now the question is, how do we engage them so that we can start shifting? And that's, that's why I, for example, do talks like this, to start moving the needle. I don't pretend to convince all of you guys to become what I am, but if I can move you on that needle towards greater individualism, greater respect for free markets, greater respect for the founding, 
then I think we move the needle, we move the conservative movement, we move the political landscape in this country towards more freedom. You, you've talked about the conservative movement and Republican Party um, being the best potential for some of the objectivism yeah. uh, from the ideas of, of objectivists. But a uh, big part of the, con of the conservative movement and the Republican Party consists of something called neoconservatism, neoconservative neocons as they're called. And these are people who want to take those ideals that you talked about, that American uniqueness, and spread them to other societies. How does that fit in with Ayn Rand? And we will get you, Mr. Selmaska, shortly. Yeah, it depends how long, how long of an answer I give to this. <laughs> could be a long answer. You've written on this. I have. I've written on this extensively. So uh, the answer relates to the neocon foreign policy, which, I, again, I don't think is the main project of the neoconservatism. I think they're much more interested in domestic policy. But so the idea is you want you, you went over that a little fast. And I, I'm, they're much more interested in domestic policy. They're much more interested in domestic policy. But let me talk about foreign policy, and then we'll get to domestic policy. Um, what is the neocon uh, foreign policy? And I think it was articulated during the Bush administration as well as it's been articulated ever. Uh, many of the people within the Bush administration were neocons, or the Bush wasn't a neocon, and I don't believe Rumsfeld is a, is a neocon. But many of the many of the people they were. Um, and, and it is this idea of being the policeman of the world, bringing American ideals to the world, bringing democracy, right? The forward strategy for freedom was, was at one point Bush's definition of his foreign policy. The forward strategy for freedom, we go to Iraq, we set up a bastion of freedom in Iraq, the rest of the Middle East looks at Iraq and says, cool, we want some of that, and they all turn democratic. And there's so many confusions and problems with this that it's hard to know where to begin. But let me start with the fact that America is not a democracy, maybe the most important point to make, which the neocons don't get. Democracy is a bad, bad, bad system of government. Now, democracy, I mean majority rule, where you vote on everything. Right? Uh, the classic democracy was Athenian democracy. And the founders, by the way, wrote extensively about this. If you, if you think I'm a kook for not liking democracy, read Madison. Madison hated democracy. Um, in Athens, they had a democracy. Uh, the townspeople, the people who could vote, which weren't everybody, but a lot of people, uh, landowners, you had to be a landowner, you couldn't be a slave, you couldn't be a woman, but all the men who are owners of property would get together and they would vote on anything. So Socrates, who was a famous philosopher in Athens, was walked around the streets of Athens, was known for this, and engaged young people in discussion, and he would be provocative, and he would ask difficult questions, and he would challenge their beliefs, particularly their beliefs about the gods, right? And the people of Athens were very concerned about this. He was corrupting the youth, right? So they got a meeting together, and they voted. I don't know what the vote was, 51% to 49, 60 to 40, 90 to 10. It doesn't matter. They voted. A majority voted to have Socrates killed because he wasn't doing what they wanted. He was corrupting the youth, and they knew they couldn't like restrict him because he would never go for it, right? So they, they gave him a, a, a cup of, ch of uh, poison to drink, and Plato, his student, Plato uh, says to Socrates, he says, I got a tunnel, we can escape. At least this is one story. And Socrates says, no, I believe in democracy too. And he drinks the cup and dies, right? That's democracy. Democracy, there's no free speech, there's no private property, Everything, your, your neighbors can decide to turn your house into a, table, uh, into a tennis court if that serves the community. Oh, they can do that in America today. Um, it's called Kilo, right? We have become a democracy. That's the case from uh, Connecticut. Yeah, where, where they turned it at Walmart. Property rights. Right? Tennis court, Walmart, what the, what's the difference, right? Um, <laughs> the point is this country was not founded as a democracy. It was founded as a, fed, as a federal constitutional government that protected individual rights above all. So 99% of Americans could vote to silence Socrates, and they can't, because we have free speech. That is, his individual right to speak is more important than the votes of 350 million people. Think about that. That is unbelievably undemocratic. So this country is not a democracy. So what happens when you bring democracy to the world? They vote, and guess what? They're not like us. They don't vote for free speech and private property. They vote for the worst monsters possible because that's their culture, unfortunately, and I'm, you know, it's just the way it is. So when you give the votes to the Iraqis, they vote for Sunnis and Shiites 
who hate each other's guts and who are dedicated both to Islam and Islam is in their constitution. There's nothing about individual rights in their constitution. There's no political freedom. There's no economic freedom. There's no freedom of speech. Uh, you know, you don't want to be in a, you don't want to commit adultery, you know, God forbid, in Iraq these days because you get stoned. I mean, that's not Western freedom or you give democracy to the Egyptians. And they vote in the Muslim Brotherhood who are the spiritual fountainhead of Al-Qaeda. There's no difference between them. Al-Qaeda just chosen to take over the world with weapons, and the Muslim Brotherhood are going to take over the world democratically, one country at a time. But they still want to impose Sharia. They still want to tell you how to dress and what to think and what to do and everything. So this is what democracy so The idea of spreading democracy is such a sham, and it's, it's, it's not America. It's not even spreading America. And that was a neocon project. But generally... Ayn Rand did not believe, and this sounds like Ron Paul, but it's not Ron Paul, and I'll, I'll differentiate in a second, did not believe in America being the policeman of the world, not believe in having troops all over the world. She didn't believe, even during the Cold War, in being a member of NATO. Um, she did not believe in, um, in going out and finding war. She, she was against the war in Vietnam. She was against the war in Korea, um, and she would have been against... Um, you know, against bringing democracy to the world. What was she for? She was for an incredibly strong military that, if attacked, would destroy the enemy and come home. So she was all for dropping, and I, I, I'm one of the foremost advocates for the dropping of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I, I call them one of the greatest moral acts in human history. Uh, they were an act of complete justice, and libertarians hate me for this because many libertarians are pacifists. Uh, and and this, is, this is why Ron Paul is different. I believe Ron Paul is a pacifist, even though he won't say it. He doesn't say it. But many libertarians, unfortunately, are pacifists. Though many libertarians believe that 9-11 was caused by us. Ron Paul has actually said this. We, we're to blame, and we should apologize for it. I believe that after 9-11, we should have found who did it, and we should have destroyed them. And when I mean who did it, I don't mean the particular individuals who did it. I mean the entire infrastructure of who did it, including who gave them money, who gives them spiritual support, who prays for them, who helps them. And there are only two countries, by the way, who are responsible for this. Uh, we put out a four-page ad in the New York Times and Washington Post three weeks after 9-11, identifying the two countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia. I was against Iraq. I was, you know, you had to go to Afghanistan because bin Laden was there, but it should have been a quick operation, kill as many al-Qaeda as possible and come home. Uh, you know, why are we building sewers and schools in Afghanistan? I mean, it's, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, you know, and go after Iran. And Saudi Arabia, of course, our best friend, right? Uh, so we should have dealt with Saudi Arabia in whatever way was necessary. But that's how you do it. And that's, that's Ayn Rand's foreign policy is if somebody attacks you, if somebody threatens you, remember, I, I'm, I'm all for preemption. If somebody threatens you, you destroy them in such a way that they'll never do it again. You, you teach them a lesson. And, you know, our best friends today are the Japanese and the Germans, who we annihilated. <laughs> you know, we annihilated them, and they're our best friends. Um, because you, to, in order to, if you look at human history, um, peace has never been achieved through negotiation. Peace has been achieved where the stronger side, good or bad, has destroyed the weaker side. I hope it's the good side that destroys the bad side rather than strong versus. But that's how peace is achieved, and that's just the reality of it. We're good and strong, so we might as well. Domestic. Oh, domestic. neocon domestic. So the neocons, neocons are fundamentally Platonists. Uh, they, uh, you know, and I know a bunch of neocons are going to jump up and accuse me of all kinds of things. But neocons, if you read them, are fundamentally Platonists. Uh, they are fundamentally uh, liberals. And, and it's no accident that original neocons, Irving Kristol and a group around him, were originally Trotskyites. They were originally commies. And then they became liberals, and then they became anti-communist liberals, and then they became conservatives. That's how the neocons came into being. They were all liberals who came to conservatism. And what they did is they kept the goal of liberalism. That is more equality, um, you know, uh, uh, reign in business, uh, you know, help the poor, all these things. But they, they decided that the best way to get those ends was through conservative measures, even using religion, most of them are not religious, but they, 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 they want to use, they use religion in order to achieve social goals. And I think they want to use war in order to achieve social goals. I think one of the reasons we want to be a policeman of the world is because we need a mission. 
people with a mission are easier to control. And they, they're easy, they, there's a harmony of interests. And they love World War II when we all went to war together. And there was a sudden uni, unison of, you know, there's sudden bipartisanship and, you know, touchy-feely goodness in America during that period, even though there was a horrible war going on. So they want that. And war is, a, is one way to achieve it. Another way is big social programs. They actually like big social programs. They're not against any of the big social programs. I mean, and they, they would probably be for big infrastructure programs. And they want missions. They want, and they're very statist in that sense. They're, they're collectivists. They're fundamentally collectivists. And uh, they're not, they don't believe in individual rights. You won't find in their writings much talk about individual rights. Um, they, they, they are very much, and uh, the reason I think they're Platonists is they very much believe that they're smarter than the rest of us. And that their job as leaders is to tell us how to live our life and to structure the economy in a way that provides us the right incentives to behave ourselves. So they're very, very statist, more statist than regular conservatives. So I think in that sense, they're, they're worse than regular conservatives. I want to get one quick question. Then we'll go to Mr. Selmask, I think this is one of, and we'll take one other question over here. You've talked about religion being against First Amendment type rights. You've actually spoken about that. Yeah. Could you kind of expound on that, why you believe religion is against that? Well, I, I don't think religion is necessary. So put it this way. I think religion taken consistently, uh, uh, practiced consistently, um, you know, where faith is dominant, ultimately, ultimately has to result in the infringement of rights, including First Amendment rights. Because, look, the beauty of reason is that we have a tool of debate. We have a way in which I can reason with you, right? That's what reason is about. It's about showing you facts about reality. What's that? Oh, yes. I'll, okay, I'll talk about that too. Uh, we, the whole idea of reason is we can reason one without another. We can disagree, we can argue, but there's a mechanism by which I can convince you that I'm right. I can point to stuff, to reality, to facts. That's what rationality and reason is about. When you hold something on faith, reason's out. That's the definition of faith. The definition of faith is when there's, we can't explain it rationally. And then how are you going to convince me of its truth? Well, you can't. Reason won't do it. What if it's important for you that I believe in what you believe? I mean, the first commandment is what? Ten commandments, if you know it. Thou shall have no God, something like that, right? Other than this God, other than me, the Jewish God says, right? Um, what if I choose another God? What are you going to do about it? Well, what did Moses do about it? Right? So Moses come down from Mount Sinai, right, with the Ten Commandments. And uh, I think this is actually with the laws now. So the Ten Commandments, the Jews already know the Ten Commandments, right? They know they're not allowed to worship any other God. And he comes down with the laws, and um, all these Jews are worshiping a golden calf. Right? So what does Moses do? He says, I'm going to go reason with him. No, he doesn't do that. He takes up his sword, together with his brother Aaron, who is the high priest, right? Man of God, high priest. And they take all their people, and they go, and they slaughter 30,000 people. Why? Because they broke the first commandment. I mean, that's an Old Testament. Don't have to believe me. Go read it. Right? That's how you dealt with disagreements. That's how the Old Testament deals with disagreements all the time. Now, I know there's a New Testament, but the Old Testament is brutal. You don't disagree with the word of God. Otherwise, you get hammered. You get hammered. There is no free speech. I mean, what, what do you think happens to Abraham if, if when God comes to him and says, uh, go kill your eldest son? What happens to Abraham if he says no? He's not the father of Jewish people anymore. He gets cut. Right? The only reason he's the father of Jewish people is he says, yes, he passes the test. He's willing to do anything that God tells him to do. Now, that's not an attitude that fosters free speech. So free speech, freedom of conscience, all this stuff are not creation of religion. There was no free speech. There was no freedom of conscience under the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Right? That only comes about really as an institutionalized idea under the Enlightenment, when the discovery of reason, with the, with the raising of reason above, if you will, or equal to or above religion. 
it's, it's again, it's thinkers like Locke and, and uh, the, 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 the scientists, uh, Newton and Fowler, even though they were all religious, but they all had this great respect for reason. That's when you get individualism, free speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion. Those concepts don't exist before that. There's no civilization with any of those freedoms. You know, the Greeks had a little bit of that, unless you, like Socrates, pissed them, really pissed them off. But, you know, no civilization up until the Enlightenment has any of those things. We take them for granted. We can sit here and talk about conservatives and religion and all this stuff. No other human society in human history had that until 1776. You know, some English a little bit, but even they, you know, obviously the, the Americans had a revolt against they, too much infringement on their rights. So think about that. I mean, the, I think one of the biggest problems in modern society is we don't know history. We, we have no appreciation for the values that have been created over the last 250 years and where they come from, what they are, and why history before 1776 so, is really, really bad. Life is awful. Do you know, and I'll end on this because I know we're going well, to no, well, end, I'm end of this portion questions. of the thing. No, we're going to do two more questions. There is a graph that somebody has done that plots per capita wealth, so the wealth of the average person across time. So from 10,000 B.C. onward. And, and they've done pretty good research, and it, you know, these are pretty good numbers. What do you think the graph looks like? Anybody, anybody want to take a guess? It is basically flat for 10,000 years. It almost doesn't increase. The average person did not live a much better life in 1776 than he did in the caves in the, in the Stone Age. Slightly better, but not by a huge amount. They were, they were still on the verge of starvation. They were still relying on their own crops to live. They were still subsistence farmers. There were no vacations. There were no restaurants. It, it was... It was Rough, rough, rough life. All the way to, and then 1776, and I'm using that date just because it means something for two reasons. One, it's the founding of this country. And two, who wrote a famous book in 1776? Adam Smith, Adam Smith Wealth of Nations, 1776. So it's a meaningful date. It takes off. It goes like that. That's the Industrial Revolution. That's capitalism. Nothing, almost nothing, like that. And that is a history people need to understand, people need to know, because that says everything before 1776 doesn't matter. We're going to take two more questions. Cadet Salmaska, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep you to keep it relatively short. Yeah, I'll try, because we're... Sir, you mentioned uh, Ludwig von Mises, and I've, I've seen on the Mises Institute website, they have um, a number of readings from, from noted thinkers and authors, and one of them was uh, Clarence Darrow. And they had a book from Clarence Darrow on it. And he, he talked about a number of subjects. Um, specific one I want to uh, talk about is the death penalty. And he saw it as, you know, it's pretty much state-sanctioned murder. And I think Rothbardians would kind of uh, think about it in the same way. What say you in the realm oh, of, of objectivism? Well, let me, first say, let me first say that I don't believe the Von Mises Institute has anything to do with Von Mises. I think it's a travesty that they have their name. I know this was on tape, good. <laughs> I want everybody to know this. They should be called the Murray Rothbard Institute. They are Rothbardians, they're fundamentally, they're anarchists, and, and they hold some very bad views, including this one, <laughs> uh, which I think is, uh, murder is the initiation of force. Murder is me killing you when you have done nothing physically to me. You're not trying to kill me. If I kill you while you're shooting at me, that's not murder. That's killing. There's a difference between killing and murder. And indeed, the Ten Commandments were mistranslated for a long time. Uh, the King James edition of the Bible has, thou shalt not kill. No, in Hebrew, it's thou shalt not murder. And murder is a bad thing. Killing is not necessarily. It depends on why you're doing it. Uh, so I don't think capital punishment per se is murder. I think it's killing. It's killing somebody who has lost all right to live. So if you kill people, if you take somebody else's life in a premeditated, horrific way, right, you don't deserve to live, in my view. That's subjectivism. Now, there's a different question about whether we should have capital punishment, because this, that's a, now it becomes a technical question. How do you deal with somebody who, who doesn't deserve to live? Ayn Rand objected to the death penalty, and she was against it, but not for that reason. 
She was against it because of the one in a thousand, one in a hundred chance that you would kill an innocent person. Because death is the one thing that's irreversible. You cannot reverse death. Somebody's in prison and you discover new evidence, they could be released. But if you kill them, you discover new evidence, it's gone. So her commitment was to the innocent. The guilty, the guy who really, really did it, she would have no problem you know, shooting him in the head you know, or, or finding a way to, to execute him. But because of that, whatever slight probability that somebody is not guilty, that you, know, you don't actually execute him. So that, that was a reasoning. But, um, so I don't agree with a lot of what they say on the von Mises Institute. They represent to me that faction within the libertarian movements that's the anarchist faction. Now, they do have a, some great economists. Some of the best economists in America today write for them. So I would read them for their economists, but I wouldn't read them for political theory or for, for anything else, because I, I don't think they're good. Last question. Was over here, one of you had your hand up? I was just uh, curious, sir, uh, you were speaking a little bit earlier about property rights and such. What are your views on eminent domain? Well, I, I think it's inconsistent with property rights, so I don't think it should exist. And I don't think it should exist not only um, in the case where uh, you're, you're replacing a home for a uh, shopping mall, but also when you're replacing a home for a highway. Uh, if you're building a highway, you know, if I, and I don't want to sell, then you can't build a highway. That's just the reality. So I'm, I don't believe in collectivism, right? I think you need to be consistent. So collectivists would say, but that's not for the common good. I don't believe in the common good. I don't think there is such a thing. The only good is individual good. And people are better off when their rights are respected. Even if the highway doesn't run through it, everybody's better off when property rights are respected. So they have to write, drive on a slower road. But property rights are safe. That's much more important than whether you drive on a slow road or a fast road, in my view. So, you know, objectivists are consistent individualists. They're consistent defenders of rights. Uh, and and you, you, there's no common good, the common welfare, the general whatever. None of that is valid. What's valid is your right to your property, your right to your speech. You know, if people say, Yuan, it's not good for young people to hear Socrates. It doesn't matter. He still has a right to speak it. Dr. Yuan Brook, what a pleasure. How, I mean, <laughs> insightful, yet very controversial. I Thank hope you. you'll come back again soon. I, be my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>